Adding, this video is on hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is one of the most important intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonding is responsible for water's unusual properties. Um, it keeps two strands of DNA together. It determines the secondary structures of protein. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force between molecules. And so ion ion is stronger, but for molecules, non-charged species, hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. After watching this video, you should be able to describe what hydrogen bonding is, be able to identify when it occurs, and describe examples of it and explain why the examples are important. And so when asked about boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure, the first step is to determine the types of interactions that are present. Only ionic solids experience ion-ion interaction. Hydrogen bonding strongest for any molecular species that's non-charged. Um, for other molecules, you could have dipole, 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 and dipole, or London dispersion. But hydrogen bonding is the strongest for a non-charged species. Um, it is a special form of dipole, dipole interaction, especially strong, about a factor of um, 10 times stronger than regular dipole, 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 induced dipole, or London dispersion. And so here we have FH. Uh, fluorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, and so this is a very polar bond. Remember, for diatomics, if the bond is polar, then the molecule is polar. And so fluorine will have a partial negative charge, hydrogen has a partial positive charge, and so the hydrogen part of one molecule is attracted to the fluorine side of another molecule. Remember, polar molecule, one side is partial negative, the other side is partial positive. And so we call it hydrogen bonding, but it's mainly electrostatic interaction. It's not a covalent bond, it's mainly electrostatic interaction. And so hydrogen bonding occurs when hydrogen is bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. You can remember fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen freaks of nature. And that's because fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen have large electronegativities and are relatively small. And so fluorine is the most electronegative element. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element. And nitrogen is the fourth most electronegative element. Chlorine, which is more electronegative than nitrogen, um, is a little bit ch larger than the nitrogen. And so we're just going to assume hydrogen bonding is just when you have fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Now you can have hydrogen bonds between the same type of molecule or between in different types of molecules. And so here we have water and ammonia. And so hydrogen is bound to the oxygen. It's going to be attracted to the nitrogen. This is our hydrogen bond. Again, it's not really a covalent bond. It's mainly an electrostatic interaction. And so for hydrogen bonding, you need the hydrogen bound to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, and the molecules have to be polar. Here's another example. Here we have methanol and water. And so again, we have hydrogen bound to oxygen, and then you have this attraction to the other oxygen, and again, that's a hydrogen bond. And so for hydrogen bonding, you need hydrogen bound to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, and the molecules have to be polar. And so ammonia can undergo hydrogen bonding. It's got hydrogen bound to nitrogen, but the ammonium ion cannot because it's nonpolar. And so hydrogen bonding can be between different molecules, different types of molecules, or the same type. And so here we have hydrogen bonding between two water molecules. Again, these bonds are very polar. Oxygen's the second most electronegative element. And so the hydrogen is going to be partial positive charge. Oxygen has a partial negative charge. Now this is a pretty good simulation for liquid water. Um, one second in actual time of this movie is less than a picosecond in real time. Um, molecules move really, really fast, and if you think about how small they are, that makes a lot of sense. And so you see the water molecules are rotating, vibrating, and moving, and the red dashed lines uh, represent hydrogen bonds. And so you see the hydrogen bonds are formed and broken, formed and broken. Remember, hydrogen bond, you're looking at a 20 kilojoules per mole. For the oxygen hydrogen bond, you're typically looking at something like 200 kilojoules per mole. It's kind of interesting. You know, in most compounds, the solid is more dense than liquid, but for water, the solid is actually less dense than the liquid. This is very, very unusual. And so here we have density as a function of temperature. And so for the solid, for the ice, you see that it's less dense. And so as you go from the ice to liquid, you have a large jump in density. Um, the water is much more dense than the solid. 
And the reason for that is in the solid, the hydrogen bonds are optimized, and so you have these hydrogen bonds, and you have a fairly open lattice. And then as you heat, um, the molecules are able to move relative to one another, and you actually get a more dense um, liquid is going to be more dense than the solid. Ice is held together as a solid by hydrogen bonds. When ice melts to liquid water, the regular relatively open structure of ice collapses. Liquid water can be more efficiently packed and denser than ice. Now this is really, really important because because ice is less dense, um, it freezes on top during the winter. And so we'll have lakes covered in ice, but below there's still going to be water. Now, if ice was more dense, then lakes would actually freeze completely, killing all the, like, the, the life in the lake. And so this is, a good, and again, a pretty good simulation of ice melting. And so ice has a fairly open structure. And then as you add heat, the molecules move around. They're mo able to move relative to each other. Now, you're not completely overcoming intermolecular forces, but you're partially overcoming some of the intermolecular forces. Um, and so it's really kind of interesting and unique that the solid form of water is less dense than liquid. That's very unusual. Now, if we look at the hydrides going down this column, you notice that as we go down the column, the um, boiling point goes up. And that's because for London dispersion, the more massive, the easier to polarize, the stronger London dispersion, and the higher the boiling point. And so the hydrogen telluride has a higher boiling point than the celluride and the sulfur because it's more massive, easier to polarize, stronger London dispersion interaction. Now, if we follow this line down, you know, we might expect that oxygen would have a boiling, sorry, about water would have a boiling point of about minus 75 degrees Celsius but we know it actually has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. A plot of the boiling points of the group 6A hydrogen compounds shows a trend. Based on this trend, we would expect the boiling point of water to be here. In reality, H2O's boiling point is much higher. This is a consequence of water's stronger hydrogen bonds. And so because water has hydrogen bonds, it has much stronger intermolecular forces and so much higher temperature has to be added before you actually get to the boiling point of water. Now, I really like this graph. What this shows you is that, you know, each line here represents a column. And so as you go down the column for the hydrides, you see that the boiling point increases. You know, so why does water have a higher boiling point than the sulfide selenide telluride? Well, that's because of hydrogen bonding. Now, the sulfide selenide telluride that's because London dispersion, and for London dispersion, the more massive, the strong interaction. Why does HF have higher boiling point than HCl? Well, again, for HF, you have hydrogen bonding. For HCl, we typically do not think about that as hydrogen bonding. Remember, hydrogen bonding, you need polar molecules, and hydrogen bound to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, freaks of nature. And so why does the boiling points go for methane, um, SiH4, germanium, and then the tin. And again, this just these are all nonpolar, and so it's just about London dispersion. And for London dispersion, the more massive, the stronger interaction. And so I really like this plot. You can see that the two influences, one is as you increase the mass, you're increasing London dispersion, so you're increasing the boiling point. So you see that with the red line, and these this region for the orange, green, and blue line. And it also shows you the importance of the hydrogen bonding, which is why water, HF, and ammonia have much higher boiling points than you would expect otherwise. And so hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force for molecules. Remember, that's for non-charged species. Hydrogen bonding is also important in biological systems. Um, the chains in DNA are actually held together by hydrogen bonds. DNA is composed of two sugar phosphate chains that are oriented in opposite directions. This orientation permits complementary base pairs to be connected by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are responsible for the helical shape of the molecule. And so, you know, if you have adenine, on the other side, you have to have thymine because that maximizes those hydrogen bonds. And so that's how you get the base pairs. It's based just on hydrogen bonding. 
This gives you another visualization of it. And so it's the hydrogen bonds that actually keeps the um, DNA chains together. Hydrogen bonding is also responsible for the secondary structure for proteins. And so alpha helix is one of the secondary structures for proteins. And it's kind of hard to see, but you have these hydrogen bonds. Remember, here's hydrogen bound to nitrogen being attracted to the oxygen. That's a hydrogen bond. And the secondary structures are the structures that maximize the hydrogen bonds. The stronger the attraction, the more stable. Another secondary structure for proteins includes the um, beta sheet. And so here you have hydrogen bound to nitrogen attracted to the oxygen. And so that would be a hydrogen bond. Again, it's mainly electrostatic interaction. It's not really a covalent bond. Again, hydrogen bound to nitrogen attracted to the oxygen. There's another hydrogen bond and another hydrogen bond. And so proteins secondary structure are due to hydrogen bonds. And as is kind of interesting, this is phosphopyruvate di dehydrate taste. And the primary structure is just the order of the amino acids. The secondary structures are like these helixes and the beta sheets. And so often you can look at protein structures and just think about it in terms of secondary structures. And so DNA is held together by hydrogen bonds, uh, protein secondary structures due to hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonding, most important intermolecular force or, or strongest intermolecular force for molecules, you know, for most molecules, for, you know, dipole dipole, regular dipole-dipole interactions like two kilojoules per mole, dipole induced dipole two and lund dispersion two, but hydrogen bonding is 20. And so for molecules, hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. Um, it gives water its unique properties. It holds the two strands of DNA together. It also is, it causes the secondary structures for proteins. I hope that was helpful.